And as you're looking for Mark chapter 5, I want you to look to your neighbor on both sides and say, you, you got to have a what for. You got to have a what for. Amen? Amen. You have Mark chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. Father, we thank you. We love you. And Lord, as we continue talking and trying to, to relate and understand the role of the Holy Spirit, God, that you would give us insight um, to what you're trying to teach your people through the book of Mark and and that we would be people that walk in power, that we would walk in authority, and that we would have a what for. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, as is my, um, one of my favorite topics is, is this, exposing the reality of, of that the enemy has has forces. We know the enemy has forces, right? You know, we come to Christ and coming to Christ is just not about coming to church. It's not, it's not about being a good person, paying your taxes. All those, these are things that should be afterthoughts or just a result of us changing. But the reality is that there are forces in this world that want to kill, that want to pervert, right? And there's just not a few of them. There are many. So I'm here to, I guess, I, you know, I, I'm a teacher by, 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 tr by heart, you know. I've always taught. I like to teach. Um, my graduate uh, work is in education, right? So it's, it's always been my, my desire to do that. And I, and I have a great, great class, and it's you. So I want to show you the school that Jesus took his disciples for, through. Because he had to. And, he, and Jesus hasn't stopped, although it's no longer Jesus himself doing it. Now we have the Holy Spirit. And we've been talking about the Holy Spirit in my last two messages. So, so Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's praying for us because he knows we're going to have a hard time. He understands the human condition. Uh, he understands the, 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 the propensity for the flesh to be perverted. He understands anger and discontent, all those things that that we experience in this human condition. So he took his disciples to school, and now we have the same school, the one we should all attend, but our instructor is chiefly led by the Holy Spirit that comes out, for whatever reason, God chose this plan, out of fallible men, teachers who are just one, maybe one, maybe two steps ahead of others. So we teach. Many who call themselves Christians believe that, that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, correct? But when you ask them, they say, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And then I, I have to say this, what for? See, it's not something that, uh, that you get just because you are you, you were born. No, no. See, when the Holy Spirit begins to empower a person it begins with one thing, what for? It, it would be a waste of time. Uh, it would be unwise, and God is not unwise, to give somebody such great power, authority, and understanding for them to do nothing with it. So if you think you have it, what for? And you say, well, I know I got it. Okay, then, then if you have, you know you got it, and you have a what for, then the next, if you extrapolate that, okay, then what have you done with your what for? If you've done nothing but complain, snivel, cry, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you're filled with self-pity and the human nature. 
Don't worry, I'm going to make you feel happy later. Just kind of get me going, right, man? So while God longs, and this is the thing, God longs to dwell in the hearts of men. It's not something that he, like, oh, wants to, he's playing hide and go seek. He wants to so bad, right? And he longs, but we all know that God does not dwell in all hearts of men. Why? Because he has to have a what for. When Lazarus died, remember that story, Lazarus died, and, and they came to Jesus, and he was out there, and they said, Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus, uh, the one you love is sick. And Jesus says, okay, I'll be right there. And he put him on, and they kept bugging him until finally he came and he tarried four days, and he didn't get there when, when he was still alive. He got there, and by the time he got there, he was dead, and they had buried him. And the sisters came out, we've been telling you, we told you to come, because they knew if he got Jesus here, he was going to save, but he didn't get there in time. And he goes, why, why did you do this? And Jesus says, he had a what for? See, Lazarus had to die, because he said, I have to show this unbelieving generation God's power. And then he spoke to the grave and said, Lazarus! Come forth. Now, that sounds pretty cool. And everybody on this side of, uh, of eternity was saying, man, that's heavy. I bet you the sisters were all happy. Oh, Lazarus, Lazarus. If I were Lazarus, I'd be angry. Could you imagine? Lazarus was like kicking back. All right? He was, he was walking on the streets of gold. We don't know what he was eating, but he, he was having, you know, we know he was partying. Lazarus in heaven. I mean, he's having a good old time. And all of a sudden, Lazarus, come forth. Suck them back down to earth. And people say, oh, look at Jesus. He's crying. He feels so sorry for Lazarus. No. no. He was crying because he knew where Lazarus was. And he knew he had to bring him back to earth. So he did that because there was a what for. So God doesn't just do that just to, you know, act bad. I'm bad. No. There's a what for. He had to show us the story for one, but he had to show those there the miraculous power that God has. What for? So the prelude to the encounter with Legion, the opening of Scripture, it begins back in Mark chapter 3. You see, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus understands his what for, and he's beginning to recruit people. In John, Mark 3, 1, it describes when Jesus healed a man of a shriveled hand. And, and the religious rulers of the day got angry. He, he actually broke the rule. It was a Sabbath, and, he, and the man had a withered hand. And it was like this, and God, Jesus touched it, and it became whole. And then all the religious folk, what are you doing? You can't do this. It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath. They were more concerned with their tradition than a person, than healing this man. So Jesus knew his enemies wanted to kill him. Moreover, he knew his death at the hands of man was ordained by God. He wasn't blind to it. So he knows he's going to be killed by his enemies. He knows who they are. He know, and he can't get out of it because him and God had an agreement already. It was a done deal. And he goes, wow, I have to train replacements. So he gets 12 people, motley crew. And in verse 7, it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. Because he's doing all these miraculous things. In verse 9, it reads in Mark 3, 9, because the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had, met, he had healed many so that those with disease were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You're the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. So he's going around, and, and this is an amazing thing. Can you put the monitor down a little bit, a little feedback? He goes around, and he hears, and he sees, and it says this. He walked around, and those filled with demons begin to fall down. He didn't go and touch them or anything like that. He didn't get dramatic and blow on them. He didn't, he didn't throw a jacket on them. You know, he didn't do nothing. He just walked around them. They were falling out. And when the demons begin to manifest, he says, shut up. 
Don't say nothing. That's what he said. Why? Because he had a what for? He didn't need all this interruption right now. He didn't want to deal with these people, demons rather, because he, he took disciples and he was training them. So his importance wasn't delivering. His importance was training them. Are you with me? In verse 13, the story continues, and, and Jesus went up on the mountainside. He called him to him those he wanted, and they came. So Jesus comes up, and just like today, now Jesus doesn't call, but the Holy Spirit comes up, and he walks in the church, and he calls those he wants. And that's very important because really, and it's not that he doesn't want you, but you don't have the right what for. So when you were born, there was a purpose. God did something for, for you. He maybe gave you a certain capacity, a certain ability, and you had the what for. And, and when time is right, the Holy Spirit will come around and start calling. Call, just like Jesus, nothing changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? And he calls those who know they have a what for. Some people know they have a what for, but don't care about it. So he get, calls them, and remember, there was multitudes. It's not until this chapter that he begins to separate 12. And he had separated these 12, and it said he designated them as apostles. And it says there in verse 14 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Very, very important. So when God begins to separate you, he doesn't separate you just because he wants you to play kumbaya and, and, and look cute at church. Although, if you look cute, that's okay. But he called you because, and it's very, very, very particular, very specific. First of all, that they might be with him. So the project, when God, the Holy Spirit calls you, he calls you that you might be with him. But it didn't stop there. Some people just like that. Oh, that's good. I got the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's all I need. And they just want to stay in the presence. That's why they create monasteries, because people don't want to do what they're called. They just want to be in the presence. Hum. Hamana, 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 hamana. All they want is the present. But that's not why God called you to be in his presence. No, he called you to be in his presence. Why? That he might send them out to preach. And, say and. and. To have authority to drive out demons. Now, when, when you look at a congregation, any congregation, I don't care if our size or to 10,000, you might be able to pull one or two who would say, I'm, gonna drive, I'm ready to drive out a demon. I, I'm ready to preach the gospel. Because they'll say, oh, no, no. That's, that's spooky. I can't drive out a demon. We, we need ghostbusters. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh, you know, who are you going to call, right? Ghostbusters. No, no, we're going to call you. That's why he called. He said, these are the 12 he appointed in there from the, um, chapter, verse 16 all the way down to 19. It lists them. Peter, James, Paul, even all the way down to Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, Peter, I mean Philip, Bartholomew, Andrew. He began to list them all. And these were the t 12 because Jesus had to make a decision. I'm going to die pretty soon. They're going to kill me. I need 12 to leave these techniques, if you will, so that they can impart them to others. So he takes these 12, these special 12, and this is, this is the first time he really begins to separate. Before that, he called them all, follow me, follow me, and people would follow him, and he had multitudes of them. Remember earlier, another story, it says he sent out 70, two by two, remember that? But that was before the 12 were separated and designated. Here they are designated. Just like there, God is looking in this crowd and recruiting you. But this is, this is an all-volunteer army. Amen? Those who, who come must come willingly because they choose to, not because they've been coerced, they've been forced, they've been made to. No, no, no. To come and really to walk with the Spirit of God and to be with the Holy Spirit is very evident. If you're not preaching and, and moving in the gifts, then you're, you're not with the Holy Spirit as you should be. People say, well, come on, Pastor. I ain't got to get the preaching. Then, then why don't you be quiet? Did I just say that? I did, huh? Everybody can preach a little bit. Even the most, you know, it's proven the most introverted person 
affects 14,000 people in their lifetime. Let me say it again. The most introverted person, you know, the one I'm shy. Oh, I, mean, I get embarrassed. The most introverted person affects 14,000 people in their lifetime. Even introverts preach. See, you're not called to preach at equal levels. You're called to preach at your level. You're called to teach at your level. But you have to do it. If you're walking with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit won't give you something that you can't handle. He'll only give you what you can handle. But he will walk with you and say, okay, this is your, this is your, your capacity. Go. Right where you're at. God is recruiting you. Look at your neighbor and say, God's recruiting you. Now look at the other side and say, God is recruiting me. Yeah, now, uh oh, everybody got real quiet. <laughs> See, the Spirit of God is speaking to the Spirit of man. Do you have a what for? Your spirit either responds or rejects the call of God. It's, very, it's not that complicated, it's very simple. See, God's man. And this is, I think, this is, this is how people try to, uh, you know, everybody looking for a loophole? Got to find a loophole, right? And so we understand that God's call, got a call, and he's calling you and recruiting you. So men are always looking for a loophole because men really just want to do their thing. And that's, just, that's common to man. We want to do our thing, so we're always looking for a loophole. Is there a lawyer in the house? Can you find me a loophole how to get out of this? Right? They're always looking for a loophole. And here's the loophole. And I think it's, it's a well-intended and a purposely put loophole. God uses the voice of infallible man to call you. There's your loophole. All you need to do is destroy the messenger and you can do anything you want. It is not like God, see God could have not given you a loophole, but he gave it to you because he wanted you to understand that when you, if you arrive in hell, you weren't tricked. You found the loophole and you used it. And what do I say? Hell is full of volunteers. God makes so many efforts. He, man, he has, he has evangelists on TV. He has crazy Victor Outreach passing out flyers. There's, ch there's 422 churches in Colorado Springs. If you go to hell, you have to try hard. It's a hard thing to go to hell in the United States. But somehow people figure it out because they're always looking for a loophole. Let me get back over here. See, more often than not, people reject God's call based on their relationship with God's man. So Jesus is taking them to school. Because, you know, at that time, the majority of the population hated Jesus. It was only a little bit. So the people, the, the religious rulers were trying to destroy him, destroy him, his, 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 um, how people thought of him, right? Hit the perception of him. They, they didn't like him. That's why anytime he did something wrong, you can't do that. It's a Sabbath. You can't do that. You can't. And they were trying to destroy Jesus because they knew if we can get to Jesus, then his followers will fade away. That's why they ultimately killed him because they thought if they killed him, it would end the uprising. They didn't know that that was part of God's plan. So in verse 21, Matthew 3, 21, Jesus again taking him to school. And then Jesus entered the house, and, and there's a crowd gathered there, and, and his disciples were there. They were able, they were just there, and they were so crowded, they weren't even able to eat. Then his family heard about him, and they wanted to bring him back, because at this time, his family said, my son Jesus is crazy. Mary said Jesus was crazy. Now, if you're a Catholic and Mary called you crazy, you'd be upset. Mary called Jesus. He's out of his mind. So they come to where he's at, and they come to find Jesus, and they're outside. And they know his boy's crazy. And his brothers, Jesus is crazy. His whole family, and it says there in verse 21, for they said, he's out of his mind. Imagine that. I can relate to that because when I got saved, my mom used to tell me I'm crazy. Actually, she told me, be careful, don't go to that church too much because you might go crazy. She told me that. And I go, mom. Mom, check this out, mom. I was 25. I go, you didn't know this, but I was dealing, stealing, stabbing, running, and jiving. 
I was crazy. I'm finally in my right mind. Then she looks at me, don't make up stories. <laughs> huh? When you're following Jesus, when you're walking with the Holy Spirit, you're, you have this relationship, but we have many forces that are against us. So what they try to do, they try to attack you as a person. And if they can't get to you personally, then they begin to attract those around you to pull you from the things of God. And they'll say things like, oh, you, you shouldn't go to Victor Arias. They'll go out to radical. You shouldn't do that. But you shouldn't do this. Or another meeting. Are you going to the streets? That's embarrassing. How can you go to the streets? That's embarrassing. And they're just going, 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 going. Why? Because what they're really saying is you're crazy. No, you're walking with the Holy Spirit. The same day he was in the house, accused of being crazy by people, he was also accused of being allied with Satan. Not only is he crazy, he's, he's Satan's enemy. That day his family tried to take him home because they also thought he lost it. This is the day where Jesus got everybody mad at him and where most preachers don't like to preach about him. They skip this part. He defined, described, delineated his family. And he didn't do it long, drawn out. He did it very simple. He did it in one sentence. Those who will do the will of my father are my brother, mother, and sister. Verse 31, it reads right there in Mark 3. Then Jesus' mother and brother arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone to call him. A crowd sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. So now when you say that, now you understand why most preachers don't like preaching this because they don't want to get the whole congregation mad at them. My problem is I just got to preach the full gospel and let, let, let those who will find their what for, find their what for. He drew the line. You know that? Cross that line. Now, and when he drew a line, it was a line. When you crossed it, it was over. Go ahead, cross that line. He drew a line. He, he drew, and that day he was, he was like on the line uh, drawing business. He was like on a line uh, uh, drawing uh, mission. He called the Pharisees wicked. He called the entire generation, you wicked and unbelieving generation. He drew a line. Jesus declared... You are either for me or against me. And so in these events, after these events, rather, Jesus went out to the lake and he began to tell them parables. Remember, all of what I just described happened in, in, in a few days at most. And so he's walking along the path and he's going towards the lake because he told the disciples, have a boat ready. He knew what he was doing. He was taking everybody to class, in particular his disciples. So they had the boat ready. And so he's there and, and he's talking and talking and, and drawing lines, drawing lines, drawing lines. And he's getting to the lake because he has an ultimate goal to teach his disciples. Remember, he's only really focusing on 12. Although he's talking to multitudes, he's focusing on 12. Right? So he's speaking to the spirit of man through parables. See, the mind, you know, educationally, the mind of, of humans is very, very unique. You, they call there's a, a, a thing called stacking. When you, when you teach, you, you put a basic principle, and then you stack, and you stack. But you start here, but you know you want to get, but you can't just get there. You got to stack, 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 stack. And after, or that's stacking, scaffolding, I'm sorry. And as you scaffold up, you're getting to the point what you're trying to teach. Well, Jesus has got to get him, his disciples to the other side of the lake. But I can't get there because these guys ain't ready for it. So he has to scaffold what it means to really follow him, what it means to have anointing, what it means to have authority. So he's scaffolding and getting him to his final lesson plan. Are you with me? See, in school, well, I can say it before I say it. See, Jesus, Jesus is teaching a faith lesson. In school, you have a prerequisite, correct? You want to uh, go into algebra. You can't go to algebra unless you take pre-algebra. 
Then you got a pastor algebra. If you want to go to calculus, you could, but you want you want to get your trig underneath you. Once you get trig underneath you, then you take another step, calculus, and then you know. But you have to have a prerequisite. There's always that. See, before you attempt your bachelor's, you must obtain your what? Your associates. Before you get your doctorate, you must obtain your master's. So your term degree, your terminal degree is preceded again by your graduate degree. Why am I saying this? Because I'm trying to teach you what, how Jesus taught. He was teaching them parables to get him somewhere. I would call these parables like an associate's material. It wasn't deep stuff. It was the associates. To get him to do their bachelor work. But why? Because he knew he was going to die and they would no longer have the master. The reason for pre prerequisite is to ensure you can handle the material. The school of faith. In Matthew 4 through 3 through 25, Matthew 4 3 through 25, belong as one story. And he's there at, at the lake, and he teaches first about the parable of the farmer. We all know the parable of the farmer, right? There's a farmer, and he puts seed on shallow soil. There's some that fell on the footpath, one to, on top of underlying rock, right? Some went to the thorns and got choked out. And he talks about all that, and he's teaching them. The footpath is the place well-traveled where the seed is most vulnerable. Now listen, most Christians walk with God on the footpath. See, the road I'm talking about is not a well-traveled road. In fact, it's a rocky road. It's the hardest road you'll ever traject. So most don't like the rocky road. They like the well-traveled road. And so what happens on the well-traveled road, the seed of God falls upon it, falls upon them, but because it's well-traveled, it gets stepped on. How? Why? This is how it does it. Because men, remember men are, men are the mouthpiece. And God's got a call. Everything's personal. But you have so many different points of view. And so you, you get to choose what point of view you want. And so it's so well-traveled. It says that it's so well-traveled that the Word of God, the Holy Spirit's leading and wanting to grab you. That true touch between you and Him gets stepped on, stepped on, stepped on, stepped on. Right? Then you have all this, all kind of stuff. One saved, always saved. Only baptized in Jesus. King James Version only. Right? This and this, this and that. And they're just well-stepped, well-traveled. And it is. The Word of God is so tramped on. People can't figure out what's right or wrong. Shallow soil does not give enough room for spiritual growth. Because soil represents the person you, you subscribe to. And what happens is we are a very shallow generation. Shallow. Shallow. We are in the Twitter conversation world. Right? The, you know, it used to be 140 characters. And that's all we want to communicate. People no longer want to face each other and have a conversation. It, it's weird, you know, you could go to a person, like a young person, especially millennials are more us, we're, we're kind of trying to catch up to this technology, but the millennials, they're like at home on the speed, their thumbs, like, their thumbs are like buff, big old muscles. <laughs> right, because they're just, they know how to do that stuff. And you talk to them, hey, how do you feel? You want to talk? Oh, no, nothing. Or text me. And you go home, they text you, they have a dictionary. <laughs> Why? Because there's a shallowness to their interaction. And see, God is not a texting kind of a God. He lives by the word, by conversation, by interaction, by prayer, by supplication, not by text alone. And so what happens, the world has become more and more shallow. So, the, so if it doesn't get conquered on the footpath, it's so shallow, it doesn't have no room to grow. Because people are not used to going deep. With God, you got to go deep. He's got to get into your crevices, into the crack, into the hidden things. You might look good on the outside, but he wants to get in deep. And people don't like that. Hey, get out of my deep. Stop that. Even right now, some of you are feeling uncomfortable. I'm going to get deep on you a little later. Then you have the thorns, which are the, the worries of life. That conflict with God's ministry, you, you worry, the thorns. Jesus died with the thorn crown, right? Because the thorns represent worry, and they put them on the head. Because your battle, my friend, the enemy's warfare is to attack your mind. 
He just can't come there and knock on the door and you walk, come on in. No, no. You have to open it up. So his role is to create devices to get in your head. Number one device, music. And he gets in there. Music gets inside there. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of uh, pastors will say, hey, you know, be careful, don't listen to secular music. Well, there you go. You have something wrong. No. But if you can't handle it and it gets in your head, it's going to mess you up. Because now you've allowed the avenue of the devil to get into your head. I mean, come on, let's second music. Some R&B is, 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 is my girl, my, my blankety blanks. And I don't understand how women can listen to that music when they're calling you a female dog. And you're, oh, yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm yours. <laughs> Bow, wow, yippee, yippee, yay. Who let the dog out? You did. <laughs> but the music gets into your head. The next thing? Now, it used to be TV and movies. Not even TV no more. It's YouTube. <laughs> Internet. <laughs> so now the devil's getting in your head. Why? Because he knows the thorns will eliminate you from your what for. It's a battle. And then there's also those, praise God, I, I believe we're full of people like this, that are fertile soil. Now, fertile soil doesn't happen by accident. You have to make it fertile. I planted grass at my house last year, right? My house used to be the ugliest house because we just moved in in the whole street. Now it's the nicest. But what we had to do, we had to rip off the old soil, huh? about two inches, took it all off. Then I got new soil, and it was full of fertilizer. Because I, I want a good soil. And you know what fertilizer is? The best soil for fertilizer? Poo-poo. See, some people say, oh, my life was miserable, and I'm going through so many changes. And all, all, no, 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 no. All those hard times, all that, can I say like that, all that poo-poo you're going through <laughs> makes you good soil. Come on, yeah. Makes you good soil. Why? Because when the devil tries to trick you and say, oh, you can do this, no, 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 I, I, I know that, no, uh, uh. why, because you got a little bit of, of that stuff in your soil that messed you up, no, no, that's poo-poo. That thing made me, uh, 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 I ain't doing that. Oh, you, let's go do this, oh, no, no, I ain't gonna do that poo-poo because it got me messed up. Why, and you're doing all this, why? Because you know, I gotta stay right, I gotta keep my soil, good soil, why? Because I gotta have a what for? Huh? So he moves on. Again, he's teaching his disciples. Then he tells them in parables, right? And he says this to the, all of them, ears, to hear, will understand. Those who have an ear to hear will understand. Because the multitude look, looked at him like, what are you talking about? Like, is there a few of you here getting mad at me, you're trying to keep your head down, don't want to look at me like as if my, my words won't get penetrate your head? It's too late. I got in your head. Huh? And so, so they're here, and Jesus says, if you have an ear to understand. See, an ear to hear and understand is code for light. See, at that moment, like now, some began to understand. The light turned on. So the light's turning on, and so what does Jesus do? He goes right to the parable of the lamp. And he began to talk about the parable of the lamp. And he said, if you have a lamp, do you hide it? No. Uh, what do you put on a lamp? You put it on a lampstand so everybody can see it. Wherever, you don't hide something that's good and of God. You bring it out in the light, right? Then he says, anyone who hears should listen and understand. Understand this. Jesus was bringing light to a darkened people with the intent of placing his light into man's spirit. Why? Because he had to give them a reason to exist. Without their reason to exist, there was no need for the Holy Spirit to live in their heart. And he wanted the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. Why? So that you could accomplish great things. He who has a hear, an ear to hear, let him understand. So he's teaching. Jesus addressed the crowd personally. In Mark 4, 3 through 9, he names four types of crowd members. In Mark 4, 21 through 25, he enters into the soul of the crowd. 
the hidden recesses of the conscience. Jesus, then Jesus blesses and curses. It's all in Mark. For the sake of time, we can't go there, but you need to read it. He blesses those who hear what God is saying. And in verse 24, he added, play close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more you'll understand you'll be given. And you will receive even more. So he'll give you bottom level, bottom shelf. J. Vernon McGee would always say, keep it simple. Keep the cookie on the bottom shelf. And Jesus will start on the bottom shelf, little cookies. And then if you understand, you say, oh, man, that's a good cookie. Then he'll take it up to another notch. But he won't take it to this notch because he's going to start you here. And he's going he's to grow you. He is going to scaffold you. Most people just like cookies. And they, don't want, they want to stay there. He goes, look, Paul got fed up with it. He goes, ah, you guys should be teachers, but some of you, I still got to give you milk. Because most Christians, I'm going to say most Christians, just like cookies. Huh? The closer you listen, the more you understand. Verse 24, Mark 4, 24. The more you understand, you will be given, and you will receive the more. Verse 25, to those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But to those who are not listening, even that little understanding they have will be taken away. This is Jesus talking. So if you've been in church too long and have learned too much and have done too little, by now you have to start all over again because Jesus done ripped it away. Isn't that heavy? Now, don't get mad at me. It's not my fault. It's in the Bible. <laughs> then he goes, proof your ears are listening. He can keep going. Because uh, I'm listening. Okay, well, let's see. Let's see if you're listening. Verse 26. The kingdom of God is like a farmer. The farmer who are those who operate by faith in, as God's agent, who scatter seed on the ground. In verse 8, Jesus calls this fertile soil. Remember that? Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand what had happened. Verse 28, the earth, the earth is combined of all total fertile soil, right? Produces the crop on its own. First, a leafy blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the gripe ripe ripens. As soon as the grain is ready, the, the farmer comes out and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. So he's saying, okay, if the word is planted into the soil, who's the soil? Who's the soil? You're the soil. We're all soil. Adam. Adam is a Hebrew word meaning dirt, clay. So we're all soil. So the word of God even now is going into a bunch of clay balls, soil. Some of you have fertilizers because you've been through all kind of mess, and if you're wise, you can use that sort of fertilizer to make you better. Some of you don't like poo-poo and you want everything perfect, and when somebody hurts your feelings or tries to rebuke you, oh, you rebuke me. Why are you talking about me? Come on, man, you need soil. You need that fertilizer. Yeah. You got to take a rebuke unless you're perfect. And let me tell you, I love you, but you ain't perfect. You need a rebuke. That rebuke is part of your soil, part of the fertilizer. Some of you ain't been rebuked enough. Let me get back here. I'm trying to preach myself happy right now. <laughs> See, then he goes to the parable of the mustard seed. First he talks about the soil. Then he talks about mustard seed. Man, mustard. He's got soil, thorns, mustard seed. The kingdom of God. What story should I use to illustrate it? Verse 30. It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It's the smallest of all seeds. It becomes the largest of all garden plants. It, it grows long branches, and birds make nests in its blades. So if one looks at the, into these parables, one can quickly see that these are stories of faith. And remember, when he, when he was saying it, he wasn't saying it initially for us. Eventually it was for us, but initially he had 12 students that he had to train then he begins to turn teaching to understanding. Verse 35, and evening came, Jesus said to the disciples, let's go across to the other side, to the lake. So remember, he's getting to the final exam. So they took Jesus on the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a force, fierce storm came. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Now dig this. This is very interesting because this just hit me. Jesus is taking these 12, 
across to the other side. And other people follow. Because, you know, there are people that really have a heart towards God. They, they, they do. But they haven't been through the scaffolding process. Right? And, and, and God's mercy says, you're not ready for this. So what he does as those who are called are stepping to the other side, he creates a storm to shake those who, who can't ha- run, run, can't hang he creates a storm to push them back. Not to get rid of them, but they're just, they're just not ready for it. If you want to get ready, and we should get ready, then you, then you have, then, and I will say this, with all love, we have a lot of discipleship and training, and for the most part, very few go. And you're never going to get to the other side with the Holy Spirit if you don't start doing something. Because he will create a storm it could be a storm in your marriage. It could be your children. It could be anything. He, and then you'll say, well, the devil. No, 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 not that the devil. The devil allowed. It's probably God creating a storm to protect you because you can't get to the other side. You have to be able to withstand this part before you get any deeper with the Holy Spirit. So that is mercy. So if you want to get deeper, you've got to begin to train yourself, fall under orders, learn about the things of God. If you don't do that, then every storm that comes will keep you in your living room watching TV. But you'll go to church, and I'll love you, and I'll say, how you doing? It's good to see you here. But until you face the storm, until you begin to train yourself in the things of God, you'll just be there, never having a what for. So, evening came, verse 35, and I'm going to come in for landing. Jesus said to the disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. See, in order for church pew lessons to become reality, in order for church lessons to become a reality. In order for discipleships to become a reality. In order for everything that you've ever read and learned about God to become a reality. You must enter the storm. Educators all agree that the best form of learning includes on the job training. The storm prepares the disciples to infect their world. The storm equipped the 12 with faith to heal the sick. The storm gives confidence to those who make it through the storm. The storm readies you for battle, for the battle of the ages. No, my friend, do not fear the storm. The storm is your friend. When God brings a storm in your life, he's saying, you can handle it. He never gives you anything you can't handle. I don't care how bad it is, how tough it is, how hard it is. If if it is in your life, it only gets there because God says, it's your time. It's your time. Stand up. Take it. Trust me. You've apparently learned enough about God. You have enough faith for the storm. Otherwise, God would not allow it. That's good news. Well, let me say it again to somebody over here. That's good news. God bless all four of you. I said, that is good news. That's good news. Don't be afraid of a storm. Man, enjoy it. When a storm comes, you know what I tell people? When the storm comes and the waves are hidden, get a surfboard. <laughs> Hang 10. It'd be like the Beach Boys. Round, round, get around. I mean, get over there and have a good time. Because God says you're capable. God says you're able. See, he brought his disciples. Why? Because they were ready. Hmm? So wherever you're at, you're ready for it. Do you not know the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Huh? Wherever you're at, you're ready for it. If you just grab a hold of the cloak of Jesus, your healing's there. If you just believe by faith that you, that nothing formed against you shall prosper, you will win. If you just believe that you're the head and not the tail, Amen. just believe. Just believe. 
we close Matthew 5, 1 through 9. They came to the other side of the sea in the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and, and on the mountains, he was crying out and brushing himself with stones and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and fell before him. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now notice the contradiction here. On the other side of the lake, when there were multitudes of disciples, he tells the demons when they begin to reveal themselves, shut up. So no one knew what was going on. They didn't hear the demon talk. Shut up. Why? Because it, it wasn't time yet. He had 12 disciples that he had to train. He didn't want to make a confusion. Could you imagine if he would just let the demon start talking to all the people who weren't ready for it? Whoo, man, they, they called uh, Jesus Satan earlier. They would really call him Satan. Shut up. Not now. I'm training right now. I got 12 men that I haven't even picked out yet. But they're here somewhere. Shut up. After he tells them to shut up, he goes, okay, you guys, come with me. He gets across. Legion comes. Does he tell Legion to shut up? Now he's got his 12 disciples, his 12 students. He says, who are you? And now, could you imagine if you were there and you were a disciple? And this guy, and, and you know, the, the garrison, everybody knew about this man. The chains couldn't hold him. It wasn't like a, 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 a well-kept secret. They were, everyone was afraid to go there. Nobody wanted to go there. I imagine on the way on the boat going over there, they're probably saying, what is Jesus doing? Doesn't he know the garrison over there? We can't go over there. That guy's crazy. He's crazy, you know. And, and Jesus said, come on. And he said, then who are you? And he didn't have to say, come out in the name of Jesus. He, he would have said, come out in the name of me. No. He didn't have to say anything. He landed, and as soon as the Spirit saw him, what did he do? He ran towards him. See, when you're under the anointing of God, demons can't hide. By spiritual order, they have to reveal yourself whether you say anything or not. They have to. Have no problem, have no choice. This man controlled for years but not just one. He had many. Imagine that picture. Now the, the disciples are with Jesus like, what's going on here? He runs up and he falls down. And he goes, what are you doing? I beg you, don't do nothing. And he says, who are you? Why? Because he wanted to show his men that we, this is our enemy. And there are many. We're not here just to play church. Church has become the tool of the enemy. Because people think church is the end all. Church is not the end all. Church is the beginning. Amen. If this is your goal, well, this is the wrong goal. Go ahead and give the hand, Lord a hand of praise. God's goal was not to get you to church. God's goal was to get you trained. If the church is a place where you gain training and you activate, then, then they're good. But if it's not, that's not God's intent. I don't want people to come to church because they just want to come to church. I want people to come to church because they have a what for. Why do you go to church? Because I got a call of God. Why do you go to church? I don't know. I may not be the biggest preacher and I may not have the biggest audience, but I got five kids that I'm going to raise in the things of God and I'm going to be trained and I'm going to disciple them. Why do you come to church? I, don't, I might not be an evangelist, right? but I, I'm a teacher and I can be an example in my school. I'm a banker and I can be an example with all my bankers. I might not be the best preacher, but I can, my life can be a sermon. Do you have a what for? 
See, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, his role is to lead you and guide you to all truth, and he will. If you have a what for, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. The rain don't, it's only water. Get over here. Don't worry about that. You just get wet. Don't let nothing interrupt what's happening right now. Huh? You have to have a what for. If you're in this church, I pray you find it. I pray. Why? I tell people this all the time. And, I'm, I, I, and it gets more confirmed more and more every day. I'm dying. The doctor said I have an 80% 80 chance of living. They, have, they don't know what's wrong with me. Every organ has shut down. I lost 100 pounds in 30 days. Went from 236 to 139 in 30 days. I was done. And the devil thought he could kill me because Nikki, Nikki confirmed that, that this is an attack of the devil. I go, I know. I go, but he, so he thought he could kill me, but if he, if he forgot something. <laughs> he forgot something. Early in my walk with the Lord, I said, I will do this and this and this. I gave a commitment to my God, and I told him, I have a what for. And because I had a what for, death could not come into me. That was the only reason. Your purpose will make you whole. Your what for will heal your life. Your what for will cure your relationship. Your purpose in life is the reason why God will come to you, deal with you, and correct everything he needs to correct. The problem is most people don't have a what for. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.